All right, so uh, let's get started. So uh, we're thrilled to have Jian King Feng as our distinguished lecturer today. So he's um, a very eminent statistician. So he's at Princeton where he's um, a chaired professor who was the former chair of the Operations Research and Financial Engineering. He has wide ranging interests, mainly in high dimensional statistics, non-parametrics, uh, biology and finance, something he'll be telling us about today. Has won all kinds of medals and awards like the COPS Award um, for statistics, an invited speaker at the ICM, the Morningside Medal, uh, Guggenheim, and the Humboldt Prize, among many other things. So please join me in welcoming him. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your uh, very kind introduction. So um, I, I'm, you remember more than what I can remember. But uh, OK, so um, it's really a, a great honor to be uh, 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 to be here give, uh, to give the uh, data science lecture. So I know all of you has done a lot of fundamental research. So of course, I also love to talk about uh, like methodology and theory. But I was thinking also it's good when you talk about data science. So it's maybe good to combine with one field. And this is how I chose uh, this subject. And this is based on the joint work with uh, Tracy Kerr, who is, who is uh, she's in Harvard Statistics, Leon Leo Rogers Economics, and Joanne Newhero in uh, Santa Luis uh, Finance Department, and me, myself, Operation Research and Financial Engineering. So it's really a data science. Right? So these are the, I mean, three heroes of this, uh, uh, this paper. So I'll give you really uh, the introduction and then, you know, uh, give uh, like interpretable uh, assets pricing model, uh, just like most of us. Uh, so it would be, I'll take a, mo a method estimation, some asymptotic theory, and uh, the, uh, and then finally the uh, application. So in other words, the whole uh, really talk is, I mean, it's centered around a problem, conditional assets pricing model. And then we are going to use neural network as a working horse, uh, hopefully to solve uh, some of these problems. So let me begin with introduction. So it's appeared to me, if you ask me, what is the most exciting development, right? So to me, it's really the, uh, I mean, interface between statistical learning and the optimal decision. And this has created tremendous successes in like a game such as Atari, uh, AlphaGo, I mean, Texas Hold'em's, right? Control like robust hands, automatic driving, free management. Uh, like uh, interact like a uh, right share, I mean recommendation system, or even like a uh, scientific computing, like a uh, uh, protein uh, folding. Uh, and if you ask me, what are the key driver to the modern success? So in addition to computation and uh, a power and big data, I think is the uh, representation power of a deep neural network, uh, as well as their associated training algorithms. Uh, and this created really, I mean, a hype in two th around 2012 also uh, on the uh, image net competition and also in 2015 by David Silver groups on like human level control on the game playing and so on. And along with like, uh, I mean, uh, policy optimization framework of Markov decision processes. And this kind of thing is not only being applied to like a really machine learning uh, game type of uh, problems, but also has been now they widely applied to uh, policy optimization in personalized medicine as well as economic uh, treatment. So there were really, I mean, a lot of uh, breakthrough empirical successes, but we have very limited uh, theoretical understanding. And I hope my uh, talk today can contribute to, uh, to the deep learning in economic modeling, particularly in financial uh, assets pricing. So this is my overarching goal. And the, the fundamental difference probably between all machine learning problems uh, and uh, financial and economic problem is the information set, right? So in the machine learning problem or in the game, uh, the information what you give there is give there. If you see me as image, that's all me, no more, no less. In financial conditional assets pricing model, of course, we do not know what is the information set. Uh, what is the information that inference on the, uh, the future returns? So uh, we all know that uh, really, I mean, financial prediction is really hard. Returns are extremely noisy. Uh, understand, expect return, and the volatility is all what we can do. 
However, even understanding the expected returns are still really hard. I mean, most of, I mean, of them are really noise. So people may naturally ask, why it's so hard? As I said a moment ago, right? So first of all, we have really high dimensional unknown possible signals. Not only the firm characteristic, let's say of IBMs, but also our related firms and competitors, uh, firms characteristic may also come to play. So this is one uh, area. And the other area is financial economic theory, always been silenced on how signal is related to the returns. Uh, they never tell us what is really the function forms, if any. Uh, like most statisticians, uh, they will put down an, a linear model, right? Uh, we also have unknown dynamic, how things evolve over time. And then also probably relatively uh, also misunderstanding what is between mispricing uh, as well as the, uh, the compensation for the risk. And uh, of course, when you say, well, the, the form of uh, unknown function form is unknown. So let's do non-parametric modeling. But we all know very well to this audience, right? So the curse of dimensionality uh, in non-parametric modeling uh, exists almost uh, everywhere. So what is traditional solution? The classical solution is putting some structure, right? Like an attitude model, so you could achieve uh, one-dimensional rates, or like a single index model, you can achieve one-dimensional uh, rates to alleviate uh, the curse of dimensionality. So this kind of solution is really uh, structural. You impose a structure, you find the best within your class, rather than algorithmic solutions. Uh, uh, and this, is, so in other words, let algorithm choose what is really the local structure of, uh, of your uh, model. And this is where statistical machine learning, such a neural network, uh, come to rescue. <clears throat> and then you may ask me why you choose neural network as your, I mean, uh, non parametric working horse. So the first one, I would say uh, universal uh, approximation, which really is based on saying, I mean, in uh, early 90s when I had fun with Andrew Barron in Berkeley. Uh, so basically, say any super smooth function can be approximated by a neural network, a very wide neural network, uh, without curse of dimensionality. Uh, and then the explanation is very really, uh, I mean, the interpretation is really one line. I mean, the basic idea is one line of math, of course, the detail is way more complex than what I say here, is that really any function uh, can, be, or can be written, let's say, as a Fourier inversion, right? Uh, and the Fourier inversion, I can always write in as an expectation, it's an integral, I can always write it as important sampling, uh, expectation with respect to G, and then uh, take, uh, 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 with divide by G. So you think in G just a Gaussian, right? So this expected value, I can always approximate by Monte Carlo error, the sample error, if I sample n data points at random uh, from that uh, that's important sampling distribution, plus Monte Carlo error here, uh, if my second moment is bounded. Uh, and this approximation error <coughs> has no curse of dimensionality. And now you can easily see this is uh, linear transform followed by nonlinear gating is a very wide uh, neural network. So this is really, I mean, the selling point uh, in 90s, basically saying that uh, why neural network? You don't have curse of dimensionality. And we all know that's not true. The reason is the function cannot be super smooth. Uh, I mean, the function super smoothness is used here, right? The Fourier transform should have very little waste outside. <coughs> so uh, a little bit more modern version is that uh, adapt you to unknown composition structure. So suppose unknown to me, the real function is looks like this. So if you stare a little bit, look carefully enough, right? So it is really a composition of univariate, uh, bivariate, right? This is bivariate, bivariate, and bivariate, right? So, and then plus adding all those together, right? Trivariate, right? Adding all those three functions together. So it's really a composition of uh, low dimensional functions. So if I know uh, this is the structure, if this oracle tell you this is the real low dimensional structure, you could, you could construct a neural network, right? That actually very economically approximate your unknown function. So if you really do not know it, you just uh, make a bigger, I mean, a bigger, uh, I mean, rectangle, a bigger, more complex neural network, then that will know 
approximation bias is no bigger than, uh, than this function, uh, and then the complexity uh, would be of the same order if the dimensionality is uh, finite. And another attractive feature of neural network is, I mean, in terms of implementation, really there's no, if you run stock at gradient, there are little uh, curves of dimensionality in, uh, in implementation. So, uh, so for this reason, for today's talk, right, so I'm going to use neural network as a scalable non-parametric uh, workforce horse, and then just for one purpose of one slide, so to introduce the notation, this is the ReLU neural network I'm going to use uh, today, starting from input dimension. In my case, I will have uh, 62 firms characteristics, in other words, 62 dimensional uh, space. I will create uh, four linear combinations for indices, right, so this would be a linear transform, uh, right, so it would be, uh, uh, I mean, I create this, uh, and then followed by nonlinear gating, and now I get to here, uh, I create uh, a linear transform again, followed by nonlinear gating, and so on, right, so this would be the notation I use. Again, I just repeat again, <laughs> one of the main reason I use uh, this is that neural network adapt to unknown composition structure. So for this reason, I'm using uh, the neural network as my working horse. So what do I expect to get for my quote-unquote data science problem, finance problem, right? So this is the usual linear model. So you explain less the expected returns. I will hope in using more sophisticated nonlinear model, I'll explain uh, better returns. So in addition, given the high dimensional feature of your firms, I will hope, I is the firm, T is the time, uh, I will hope in that I can expect uh, I can, uh, I mean, forecasting better the uh, SS return. So this is my uh, overarching goal. And in addition, because of our model structural neural network, I not only is a black box uh, as much in the machine learning uh, literature, I will hope to open a little bit, decompose my return, where the return coming from, coming from risk premia, compensation for your risk, uh, the factor, uh, uh, evolution factor components plus uh, mispricing uh, components. So this is uh, what we hope. And because we were able to decompose into the other three components, and uh, we know that the factor just like market risk, right, evolve like a random walk, martingale difference. Uh, so I'm going to replace this one by zero, which is the best forecasting for martingale difference. And this will yield a better improved uh, I mean, uh, prediction methods. So what really my talk or this particular paper about is we impose a very mild uh, economic uh, uh, structure and then we learn uh, like expect returns from the deep neural network. Not only we get the overall returns, we are also able to decompose return into three components. For example, if we miss pricing, risk premia, and then uh, factorialization is a realized uh, risk. Uh, and for our sample, we miss pricing, risk premia, plus factor innovation. And the factor innovation components is a random walk. You cannot uh, predict that one, and you better replace by zero. And we, of course, need to provide new methods to estimate each of these three components, and uh, we'll derive some attentive theory. So in terms of data science components, right, so the empirical studies uh, will show that the actual factor accounts for 90% of R squares, uh, in sample R squares, and so it's a main component. So this component is a, the key component in, your, uh, in the system, and among those, <coughs> Risk premium accounts for 5%. Mispricing is very small, only 1%. However, sharp ratio is still bit than one, meaning that economic, uh, uh, still economically uh, important. And uh, because we were able to, uh, I mean, because we were able to decompose into th these three components, uh, we, being, we know that this factor innovation uh, should be uh, removed and getting uh, improved methods. So our, uh, <coughs> our work relates to a vast literature in these areas, particularly when money is at stake, right, from non parametric estimation and inference using uh, fee for neural network to um, now the more, more empirical studies on machine learning uh, in finance, 
or I mean to like uh, uh, factor uh, pricing models and the panel and factor regression. So there's a huge literature that relate to our work here. So let me begin with uh, the model that we have in mind. And this is really the standard uh, SS pricing model. If you look carefully, you know, it's really just a linear model, right? So the latent factor at the time t uh, right, uh, impact on the whole panel of stock in our study is about 4,500 stocks uh, at any given time. So uh, this FT uh, influence all those 4,500 stocks, and the 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 magnitude depending on this called beta, right? Then depend on the time as well as the the firm itself. And then this part alpha is mispricing, and this is equal synchronic components. So this is the conditional SS pricing model. In this model, we only observe the panel of uh, SS returns. Uh, so at any time, uh, let's say I observe 5,000, 4,000 uh, stocks uh, returns, uh, and uh, I observe this over, let's say, a uh, five-year period. Uh, so for example, that would be the data I have. And, uh, uh, and then I will assume in, uh, the factor model holds. And now here, I could be just writing in more like a financial uh, terminology by putting, let's say, for simple of my talk today, I put in the, uh, the uh, expected value of factor here and minus expected value of factor here, right? And this part, usually, we give a name called, uh, I mean, this part we give a name called the, uh, the risk premium. Uh, the first part is mispricing, and this part uh, is the, uh, the factor components, and this part is equal syncretic uh, components. So all those components are really time varying. And the, all those coefficients, right? The degree of dependence uh, depend on the latent factors uh, is also SS dependent. Now, natural question: You may say, in what way they depend on time and assets, right? So we, I need to specify the model further, uh, and this is more specified model. Uh, the mispricing can be decomposed into two components. The one component is your underlying fundamental firm attributes uh, change over time, and then plus the part cannot be explained by uh, the firm characteristics, right? And similarly, that apply to uh, the beta components. Beta is the factor loading components. So this I sometimes may refer to mispricing function, uh, factor loading function, and all those can allow to evolve over time slowly. Uh, so the only requirement, this guy, two guys, right? I really ask him, these are really exogenous from outside uh, things. So this gamma components should be independent of my firm characteristics and should be also independent of uh, latent factor. So they are uh, from really uh, external things. So this is really uh, the model uh, specification uh, that uh, that we have. So we have factor pricing model, which is really like a linear model. And then we specify how uh, the alpha and beta uh, evolve over time through the firm characteristics uh, plus the independent uh, uh, component. Uh, so this is really the, uh, the model that we are special, uh, putting down. So now <laughs> imagine that I'm using uh, a machine learning method, let's say deep neural network. So what I, would, what I would do, right? So I would say, all right, looking at, standing at today, I looking at the firm characteristic in the last period, right? So I have also the associated uh, return. So I have 4,500 uh, of those, right? So let's say 4,000, just for easy to speak. Uh, so I have 4,000 of this. So I'm going to do uh, regression, cross-sectional regression, regress my, uh, my firm's return on my firm's characteristics across uh, cross-sectional across uh, 4,000 stocks. So you are really doing the regression function. So the regression function be y given this x, right? So uh, t is fixed. Because t is fixed, uh, this latent factor ft uh, is a constant, right? You are, you are fixed at the time t period t. Right? So this latent, uh, latent factor uh, t is also being fixed because it's just like looking at today's uh, market risk. This ft is also fixed. So when I do cross-sectional regression, even though I do smoothing across sections, right? So conditional expectation of y uh, given this x, the ft is really still there. 
So in other words, what the machine learning does is typically estimating all those three components lumped together, uh, mispricing, uh, I mean compensation for the risk, <coughs> and uh, the, <coughs> the factor realization. So these three components being estimated when I do cross-sectional learning, and now I plug in, right? So now I'm, uh, you are asking me what is tomorrow's return for each firm? So I'm going to plug in my tomorrow, I mean current period XT, and I using these two forecasts in next year's return, right? So, uh, so this is what we really do. So we have very little interpretation, <laughs> I mean little interpretation on source of predictability. And one of my aim today is really to open the black box of uh, this part. So before I, I decompose each of these, so let's look at uh, uh, decomposition I said a moment ago. So when I do cross-sectional learning by using machine learning methods, I really lump those three uh, components, mispricing, uh, compensation for the risk, and factor realization, all of those three together, right? So when I put in my, move in my current xt minus one, to my current xt, so I move time period one uh, forward by one period. So you are really using these three components uh, to forecast next peer's returns. So now if you look at these three components with the actual next peer return, according to our model, so which one is off, right? So this is mispricing, that's okay, probably not off much. Uh, this is uh, the compensation for risk, that's probably okay. Only this part, the factor realization and uh, the future is factor innovation. So you use implicitly, you use factor realization uh, to forecast in factor uh, innovation. And this really doubled the variance, right? Just like I used last period's noise to uh, forecast this, uh, the future noise, so you double uh, the variance. Uh, yet, this component, as I said, account for 90% of uh, the whole, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, in sample R squares. So this component is is the dominant component. When you are double uh, the variance, so this really just uh, wash out all those uh, signals, right? So this really, uh, this step really enable us to understand and improve the predictability. Right? You may naturally ask me. Uh, in machine learning, uh, traditional machine learning uh, uh, methods we are doing here, uh, why we couldn't we just replace this by zero? You couldn't do that because when you do cross-sectional regression, right, uh, you just lumped all those three steps, uh, three components together. So when you do uh, this conditional cross-sectional uh, learning, uh, so what, what you really learn is all those three uh, steps together. So the first thing is we should introduce uh, methods to, de I mean, to decompose those three components and then add those together. So this is really uh, <coughs> come to the next part is learning predictive components. So if I thinking of cross-sectional, right? So each time I have um, I have uh, four thousand firms or five thousand firms, whatever you like to say. Uh, let's say four thousand firms. <coughs> I do. Uh, cross-sectional smoothing, uh, cross-sectional uh, regression uh, using deep neural network, I would get uh, a vector of 4,000 dimensional outcomes. So this is the same as what I write you before. Instead of putting each component, I put in a, in a, a, a vector uh, form, right? Then it would be consistent of mispricing of each firm's uh, compensation for risk of each firm's, right? And then uh, the, uh, I mean, the, uh, the realization of the risk. So this would be the, uh, I mean the, uh, if I really put in what I write here uh, in, uh, in a vector form, this would be really the form that you get. Now what is really, among these, most of these are very slow time varying. The biggest time varying is this part. Uh, the factor realization or factor component is a random walk. Uh, so therefore we need to, I mean smooth this out so that uh, I could get in the signal part, right? So this is really what we do. Uh, so you take, uh, I mean, the cross-sectional smoothing, and then you do a, a long term like a, a average. So if you sub doing this, so you are really subtracting these components out. So you really get in. Uh, so <coughs> I mean, uh, I mean, so you are subtracting this part. You are really getting the last component there. 
Now I assume everything is very slow time varying, so therefore I really have like a local, uh, I mean, a local uh, low rank structure here, right? So it would be just like a, a loading matrix times uh, the realized uh, factors. So, so, so in other words, the latent factor as well as the factor loading can be learned locally, but I need to do a cross-sectional smoothing first. So this is really the key idea of what we do. So let's say if I use last uh, 16 months or 12 months to be easier saying, okay, if I do last 12 months, so month by month, I can do cross-sectional regression apply deep neural network, right? So I get in uh, this part, uh, and then I can just do in moving average of this, right? So smooth those out, the less getting a mean out of those last 12 month uh, prediction and then taking the difference between these two, uh, so I apply local principal component analysis to learn the factor loading as well as uh, the latent uh, factors. So this is really uh, the, the key idea how we, how we learn or separate all those three components is that we assume in the first two component is much slower time varying. The last uh, com uh, component is uh, is like a random uh, random walk, and because of this, if you take in the difference or spot uh, smoothing and the long term smoothing, it gives you uh, the last part. And the last part have uh, have some kind of factor structure. You can learn this. So this is really the key idea what we do. So now, if I do a little bit more detail, the first step is month by month in our application. I have forty five. 4,500 uh, firms, I apply deep neural network. I got uh, a smooth uh, version of this MT, and uh, this allow us to have some uh, capture no linearity, and allow us to appeal uh, the uh, structural adaptation, adaptation to uh, uh, unknown composition structure uh, in, the, uh, in the neural network. And also, you know, because you know, network, I'm hoping they apply, uh, uh, I mean, approximate to a more flexible functional class. And then, uh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, so you're applying the DNN, if I understand the duration, with like input dimension roughly 40 and roughly 4,000 samples. Mm -hmm. and that's very different than like wow. other regimes where people are using deep neural nets. Mm -hmm. What are you finding? Is it Easy to train things that are, or are there things that one should be aware of in this? Um, uh, indeed, you are very, uh, this is a very uh, good question. Right? So, we are not really in, like, uh, uh, let's say, the NLP where you have, like, say, one billion uh, neurons. So, we are using uh, the more classical uh, regions. So, definitely, the convergence issues is. Uh, is one of the uh, the uh, the issue that we should concerns. So, but we starting from 63 dimension, right? So 62 firm characteristics. Uh, I do four linear combination later on, so they already give me 250. This is for one hidden, and then times five, uh, they already give me like the first. If I use one hidden layer, I have maybe only 12,000 firms. If I use three hidden layer like this, actually we uh, 12,000. We at the end of the day, we have about 36,000. Uh, 36. 360,000 neurons, around, around that order magnitude. But the training convergence is really, a, is part of a concern, as you, as you correctly point out, yeah. <coughs> okay, then the second step is to find the local trend, right? So we do uh, local kernel smoothing, so we assuming implicitly that uh, the long-term trend can be, it is smooth in time. Uh, so uh, it's smooth in time, so we apply, I mean, local kernel smoothing. So if you see everything here divided by capital T here, T is the total number of period uh, that you're under your study is because I write in uh, rescaling everything in T divided by capital T. So you apply the doing peer by peer smoothing, you apply local kernel weights. So you're getting a time domain smoothing, which is really estimating just like a, uh, a relative long-term but local uh, local trends. So this is the second step. You basically come into uh, to here uh, is really you are apply local smoothing, and the, I assume all of those are time slow time varying. You really knock out uh, this part. Right? So this is the uh, the second uh, step, and then the third step. What you are doing is really the 
uh, right, the difference between these two, which is give you the, uh, I mean, the stock and noise, right? So uh, the, the factor components. So you can learn the factor components. And once you learn the factor components, you're just using all those models. So you apply conventional uh, pharma Macbeth type of regression. You can learn the risk premia. I mean, what is mispricing. Each of those components can be, uh, can be learned. So this is, uh, now, suppose you and I were interested in forecasting right, the next period. Uh, in addition to understanding the risk decomposition, I need to extract, prolate the current risk uh, premia into, into the next period. Right? So I need to extrapolate uh, the, uh, the mispricing into the next period. So therefore, I'm using the risk premia uh, uh, at the current time t, the most, uh, most current time t, I regress on foreign characteristics. So in other words, I train another neural network. That would be the, uh, I mean, uh, one more neural network. And now I get a, a function like this. So this allow me to move uh, my foreign characteristic to the next period. Right? And this similarly apply to, uh, to the alpha components, the mispricing components, so that uh, we can get uh, each of these uh, uh, we can get uh, each of these firm, uh, I mean, uh, we can get in each of these functions and now you can extrapolate just by moving uh, the firm characteristic to the, the next period. So, so in other words, each of those can be learned. So now one of the good things uh, using neural network is that you can establish some, uh, uh, some theory. So we, uh, here is, uh, is some of those uh, theories. So, Basically saying, if you are looking at the mean square error of your uh, spot, uh, I mean, as an expected term, peer by period, uh, cross-sexual uh, regression, just like most of learning theory as in, I mean, Martin's book, right? So it would be consists of two components. One component would be uh, approximation bias, and the other is the, uh, the variance that is related to the complexity of the model. So here are the, uh, the three components, right? So this is the approximation bias uh, for the uh, for deep neural network, and uh, this is the uh, I mean uh, model complexity that relate to the pseudo dimension, which is very well uh, understood, right? By let's say Peter Butler and uh, his collaborators, and then if I talk about long term, that is, I smooth locally across time, then you have an additional error coming from time domain. Uh, smoothing. So this is, uh, the theory can be derived. Now you may be asking, what is uh, this part of approximation error? So for Lipschitz class, or for like uh, composition, uh, I mean, of Lip Lipschitz uh, class, uh, compos uh, finite composition models, um, uh, so this, uh, this bias is very well known. So you, you and uh, you can show that uh, if you optimize the neural network uh, width and uh, and the depth, you could get uh, the optimal rates uh, that are available to you. Uh, I mean, for this uh, kind of theory. So this gives us the, the learning for indirect object. But for us, more interesting is to learn what is the mispricing function, what is the risk premia, as well what is the factor components. Because all of these components involve both cross-sectional smoothing to learn the, I mean, cross-sectional smoothing, uh, I mean, cross-sectional regression using neural network, as well as time domain smoothing. So I always have all these uh, three uh, type of components in terms of learning uh, learning the alpha components, beta components, and uh, uh, the, uh, the factor components. So this is really for each time period we can learn this. Now for uh, our sample forecasting, uh, of course you can, you can never be uh, predict the martingale difference components, right? the random walk components. But we can show that uh, uh, the, uh, so if you're using our neural network, to learn the risk premia and then extrapolate to the one next period, right? Uh, to learn the mispricing. Uh, so uh, if you put uh, using these two as your uh, forecaster, the part that you did not really forecast is the martingale difference, right? But now since each of these components is statistically learned, so therefore there's a statistical error uh, there consists of uh, three components, right? So this is approximation er error, this is a model complexity, and this is related to, uh, to the smoothing error. So, so in other words, uh, each of these 
uh, can be learned and uh, uh, can be uh, applied to uh, to the neural network. So this is uh, the the theoretical parts that we basically uh, basically learn period by period, uh, uh, and then do the local smoothing to remove the uh, to remove the uh, the the uh, the factor components, and afterwards, uh, I mean, you get in a local principal component to to uh, to learn each of these. So now let me uh, using I mean empirical analysis to illustrate uh, what we really uh, uh, what we really uh, do for this. Right? So for this empirical analysis, we are using sixty firm uh, characteristics from Chris database as well as computer database, and from this paper published in. Journal of Financial Economics, and uh, uh, Andrea is one of these co-authors here in Atal uh, there, right? So, and our study period is uh, 1965 to 2018, uh, covered 648 months, and uh, on average, cross-sectional at any time, there's uh, 4,200 firms. Uh, and the uh, 62 firm characteristics, such as market cap, Right book to market ratio, profitability, investment beta, right, the price to cost margin. No, I just point to it as a random free cash flow to book value of equity and so on. Right? So you, you get an idea what 62 firm characteristic uh, is. So this is really the data uh, we have. Right? <clears throat> So now, in the empirical studies, at any time, if I stand at time t, I'm going to look back 60 months, uh, five year period. And then I do, uh, in order not to tune neural network, right? Uh, uh, I mean, very complex, uh, and then also in a very, uh, uh, I mean, different manner. So we fix neural network to be either one layer with uh, four uh, hidden neurons. As I said, that already give you 64, 63 times four, right, times five. So that already give you about uh, 12, uh, 1,200 uh, 1, uh, neurons. And if you add one more layer, you multiply by 20. You add another layer, you multiply by 20. Total, at the last layer, you have 36,000 uh, neurons. Uh, and th this is the training parameter that we are using. And then for the kernel smoothing, we, we fix everything, h equal to this. And then I consider the latent factor, that the factor drive market, uh, I mean, uh, risk premium, either be one factor, which is capital assets pricing model, or six factor, like a pharma French factor, plus momentum, uh, and then or just like even more, uh, 10 uh, factors. And uh, whether it's in sample or out sample, I'm going to compute uh, R squared this way, just normal uh, uh, using uh, this way. That would be R squared that I'm uh, going uh, to use. So the results we are looking at in sample and out sample. There's a lot of results, right? So I could try uh, one neural network, two network, and three layer neural network. So for simplicity, let's focus on three neural network throughout the talk, right? <coughs> and uh, let's look at all firms. Uh, with let's say 10 factors, right? So this would be in sample R square. So it's in sample R square more or less similar, whether whichever uh, factor you are using. And then this is really the contribution due to uh, due to the factor. This is the uh, the part. If I using this part to predict, that would be the out of sample R squares. So if you I use both of these to predict, that would be this, right? So if you compute this out of this, is about ninety percent. So in other words, uh, factor is accounting ninety percent of uh, in sample R squares. And uh, uh, if you're looking at alpha component, mispricing components, uh, so there's no really uh, mis much mispricing components. Now, if I look at the, uh, the distinction between big firms and small firms, then you can really see some kind of differences. Uh, so for big firms, uh, the factor, I mean, realization, uh, I mean, consists of, and then plus this, let's say, uh, fact risk premium, they are much uh, bigger than for the small firms, right? So this is for the uh, small firms. So here, the definition of big firms is Top 20% of uh, market capital uh, by market uh, capitalization. So if we look at the big firms, 
all, I mean, there's basically, when I use enough number of factors, there's basically no, uh, I mean, no mispricing. Now, if you look at small factors, right, so there are, uh, there are uh, so small firms that has, uh, I mean, mispricing, and in addition, the factor components, right, consist of less percent, I mean, explain less percentage than the, uh, the big firms. So this is the uh, in-sample composition. Then we were taking a look at what so-called mispricing portfolio. So in, uh, if I use in the alpha uh, portfolio, alpha weights as my portfolio weights, uh, we compute uh, the return of this mispricing uh, portfolio. Again, let me look at, uh, I mean, three layers, right? So, uh, so it's the small firm clearly have much bigger, uh, I mean, mispricing, uh, I mean, uh, the mispricing portfolio than those large, uh, than those uh, large firms. So in other words, uh, mispricing is bigger for all small firms. And if I really compute sharp ratio, uh, all sharp ratio is uh, big than one, which really means that uh, it's economically, uh, in, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Im uh, important. And we were also curious, just for purpose of understanding, when the mispricing will actually uh, occurs. Right? So we're plotting this mispricing uh, returns across time. And if you're just doing eye eyeball, right? so this is during tech bubble, uh, this is during, uh, I mean, uh, financial, uh, so I mean, uh, but also, so we is clearly indicated that uh, mispricing occurs during the market uh, panic, and uh, we compute the correlation of our mispricing portfolio with uh, the uh, the VIX index, which is the the fear index for implied volatility or SP uh, 500, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and this uh, the correlation is of course bit than zero and is uh, statistically uh, significant. And now, if we are looking at the uh, for the ensemble uh, returns, uh, yeah, it is very uh, uh, similar. Now I'm doing ensemble uh, forecasting. So if I using traditional uh, neural network that we are uh, um, a traditional uh, type of machine learning peer by peer period, period uh, prediction, I not I really don't have any prediction power in my uh, in my study. So if I look at the, uh, our methods, if I use risk premium, that's the outer sample R squares that you can uh, predict. And this is the contribution due to the alpha components. Uh, that is the predictable components, the mispricing components. And this is mispricing plus risk premium if you add in both uh, prediction component together. And this is for the all firms. So if you look at the large firms, the large firms prediction is mainly coming from the uh, risk uh, premium. Uh, there's little predictability in terms of mispricing. And now if you're looking at the, the small firms, uh, so small firm has both contribution, right? So, and the, the mispricing part is uh, pretty, I mean, significant. So in other words, if I apply just uh, like traditional machine learning methods without carefully tuning neural network architect, uh, uh, I, will, I mean, the prediction actually failed. I got, didn't get any prediction power. Uh, and you may ask me why that is the case, and that really back to our very, very early beginning, and that probably, uh, so the actual return, according to our model, is equal to uh, the mispricing of, uh, if any, of, the, of your firms, right, plus compensation for the risk, plus factor, uh, innovation in the future, and then plus whatever the part that cannot be predicted. Now, if I, you do uh, the machine learning methods using cross-sectional uh, smoothing, you are really learning all those three components together. And this component is the, the last period, uh, I mean, factor realization. So in other words, implicitly, you're using this guy to forecast in this guy. Right? And our new method is basically saying, hey, let's only f focus on these two predictable components, uh, the mispricing and, uh, the, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the risk components. And uh, that's implicitly saying that I'm replacing this guy by zero, right? Uh, so in other words, we, 
we replace, we replace this guy by, by, uh, by zero. And this is really the best, uh, the best procedure available for martingale difference uh, in the future. Right? So the, the, the traditional methods, when you land all those together, you are, the prediction error is the difference between these two. And th the difference between these two really double the variance. And our uh, I mean, new method just zero this out, so they're making uh, prediction uh, uh, better. So now if I summarize, <laughs> I know the time is up uh, and it's quick. So if I summarize what I have said, well, so what I really do today is provide you uh, new methods to understand the neural network uh, prediction in finance. We, so we do impose uh, a model, uh, so, and then we use structured, uh, uh, I mean, uh, neural network uh, as a working core to learn each uh, components. So we decompose uh, in sample and our sample return into three parts. One is the compensation for risk, uh, the factor exposure, and the mispricing. And we know that the factor exposure has no prediction power. And we know that the risk uh, premium dominant, particularly for a large firm, for a small firm, mispricing uh, can also be arbitraged, right? Uh, and uh, we allow every component to be time varying. We do not explicitly put in a dynamic. It's hard to put a dynamic on the mispricing. Rather, we use local time domain smoothing. We just assume non parametric smoothness uh, to this. And we derive the theory, uh, I mean, for this uh, conditional SS pricing model uh, in finance. And that's probably all I want to talk. There's a lot of material I must be missing. And uh, we just put the, the paper online, I mean, this year, not too long ago. Uh, thank you very much for attention. <coughs> Uh, great, thanks. So we've got time for a few questions. Anyone, any questions for the speaker? Quickly, uh, how much better is this technique, say, from traditional, uh, from traditional asset pricing models? Uh, OK, so I think when you are thinking traditional asset, are you suggesting each step I replace by a linear model? Yeah. 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 So, uh, so uh, that, yeah, that actually we, this sound of those, right? So you, uh, I think it, yeah, it, there are some uh, improvement on, in terms of uh, neural uh, network that we, we are doing here, but uh, uh, I didn't really put in the results, uh, results here, but uh, if you are thinking of traditional machine, uh, machine learning is as the methods that just, let's say, using current period uh, to cross-section build a model and move time forward one step, then actually we improve quite a lot because, because in our neural network model, in that case, None of, uh, none of traditional methods without tuning neural network actually give me any prediction power for the next period. And the main reason, as I'm trying to say, is that uh, you are implicitly using last period uh, noise to predict the future period's factor realization. And that's create a lot of uh, uh, noise in, in the prediction, and that smooth out all the signal you have. Um, thank you for an interesting uh, presentation. Um, I was just wondering how, what is the training time? So, so how long did you need to train this model? Um, okay, that's actually a very good question. So sorry I didn't really run it, right? So uh, to be very frank, so Andrea uh, is the person who ran it. Uh, I assume, it, I mean, because we are running, it's really depend on how many step of uh, stock at grading you are running because we are fixing the number of epoch. So therefore, uh, it wouldn't take, I think it should be taking a reasonable amount of time without going too, uh, too excessive. So I didn't ask him how long it take, but if you are running according to this scheme, I'm pretty sure he's chosen 2000 is within, right, let's say uh, a few days that he can get. I think this usual days is would be, I think the automatic I have in mind for studying a problem like this, yeah. Uh, so I guess I've got a question. So you talked about asset pricing with mm -hmm. deep learning. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I would have thought intuitively one of the places where you would get the biggest gains for deep learning would be for assets where pricing is very counterintuitive to humans. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, like exotic options or things like this. So can you say something about, um, you know, how you think about different mm -hmm. problems in finance? Okay, to okay. That's a very, very good question. Right? So actually, during the pandemic, one of the very rare occasion that I actually do a lot of empirical study. This is really after pandemic, actually getting more theory. So we apply, uh, let's say, neural network or machine learning to, let's say, option pricing, as you said. Uh, and one of the very important area, I think what we're doing, as you said, is there's a big improvement. I take the best mathematical finance model available, uh, learning the price. So this is my first order approximation. And now I got in the pricing error. So usually the mathematical option pricing formula only allows you to tell me what is the moneyness, the strike price, and what is the, uh, the time to maturity. Now, when I try to learn pricing error, this is really machine learning, empirical learning, liberate the whole things. Right? Before mathematical finance formula, you can have only two inputs to that. Uh, now I can add in firm attributes, uh, add in environment, all, all of those to empirical learn what is the pricing error. So this is where an error, as you said, uh, really help a lot that uh, you, you can combine the traditional math finance formula with empirical learning. Mathematical finance formula always limited to like, uh, not to some kind of input variables. When you do empirical correction of that, you help a lot. Uh, another area we were doing was uh, like uh, doing uh, sentiment learning based on, let's say, financial news wires. And the particular area that we're working uh, was on the um, Chinese tax data. And we found out that if you are very simple using some of those machine learning uh, techniques here, you can learn sentiments uh, very well and uh, you can really have a lot, way more gain than what I, <laughs> what I present here uh, when you are using, like, combined with those, like, uh, 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 I mean, uh, extra, I mean, uh, external variables. So you can do many things uh, very well. And, uh, and then as one more question, since during the pandemic, what I'm doing, I, we were also using, like, night lights data, a lot of empirical so night light data. Uh, in Shanghai Pudong, so area, so this is like monthly data. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we also have like a government land planning data, uh, along with trying to predict housing usage. So, so it's very powerful. I mean, as a data scientist, I could have present one of those empirical studies, but I thought people here would like to see more structure of some theory. That's why I chose this, but this is, uh, yeah, a combination between uh, no, I mean, uh, machine learning theory and data science. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but that's what we do <laughs> in those, those areas. Any other questions? All right, so let's thank John King again. Thank you. <clears throat>